Welcome to Architreats Food for Thought, sponsored by Friends of the Alabama Archives. Remember, we need to turn off cell phones before the program begins. Uh, we don't want any interferences. Many of you have received the new Archives Electronic Newsletter. I hope you're enjoying this newsletter and the reminders that we send you about the programs that we have here at the Archives. There is a sign-up sheet in the hallway. If you would like to uh, give us your address, your email address, or if you have not received the electronic newsletter and you have given us your email address in the past, just give it to us again and I can double check to make sure we were able to read it clearly and uh, make sure we have your correct address. This year is the 90th anniversary, <clears throat> excuse me, of the armistice that ended World War I in 1918. We would like for you to join us for a symposium um, on World War I. There are brochures in the hallway. On July 25th, which is Friday, we have uh, sessions for teachers. And then on July 26th, on Saturday, we have sessions for the entire public, which include sessions on literature and history of World War I and the tours of the sites here in Montgomery that are associated with World War I. So be sure and pick up a brochure so that you can learn more about Alabama's history. Also, there will be a birthday party for Zelda Fitzgerald. You don't want to miss that. Uh, also, we have um, other workshops that are coming in August. On August the 2nd, there is a workshop called Unlocking the Past. If you are just getting started doing your genealogy or want to research here at the archives, want to know more how to get started, pick up one of the uh, postcards that we have in the hallway. This is called Unlocking the Past, Your Key to Successful Research at the Archives, August the 16th. So join us for that workshop as well as on August the 9th, which is a Saturday workshop called Tips, Tools, and Treasures. Uh, we have Tom Turley who will be giving a program on an introduction to Alabama local government records. This workshop is free and it only lasts an hour from 10 to 11 here at the archives. We'd also like to invite you to join us next month for ARCA Treats on Thursday, August 21st when Jennifer Chandler presents Alabama Sports Great and Alabama Hall of Fame. This is in conjunction with the Bureau of Tourism and Travel's 2008 Year of Alabama Sports. At the conclusion of today's program, Lee's Alabama Boys at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Archives Chief Curator Bob Bradley will show and discuss the flag of the 5th Alabama Infantry, which many of you have probably seen here on display. Today's speaker is an assistant professor at Auburn University, Montgomery. He received his PhD from the University of Tennessee, and he has published Tennessee Radical Army, The State Guard and Its Role in Reconstruction, 1867 through 1869. Currently, he is working on a photographic history of Alabamians during the Civil War. We look forward to that. Please welcome Ben Severance. Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Thank you Sherry and, and I would like to thank the archives in general for inviting me to talk to you today. As Sherry said, I'm working on a photographic history of Alabamians during the Civil War and what I'm going to present to you here today is a kind of a snapshot of that. I've got about a dozen photographs of Alabamians who fought at Chancellorsville and I picked Chancellorsville as a way of illustrating the larger story, not only because it's Lee's greatest victory and one of the most improbable victories in, in military history, uh, given the odds, the two to one advantage the Union had going into the battle. But it also, I selected it because the Alabamians who fought there, their performance was, was outstanding from beginning to end at all points in the battlefield. They play a crucial role, and in my opinion, uh, Chancellorsville is Alabama's finest contribution to the Army of Northern Virginia and the Eastern Theater of the War. And so I would like to, at this point, just 
get into the, get into the battle. See how the document camera is working here. This all, there is some focusing problems, so bear with me on that. Uh, but I want to provide a little, provide a little bit of context and setting before going into individual studies of some of the Alabamians that fought there. It's the spring of 1863, uh, let's say April, and in in that month, 60,000 Confederate troops under Robert E. Lee are occupying the vicinity around Fredericksburg, the high ground overlooking that town. This is the scene of a bloody battle the previous December where Lee repulsed a Union invasion. Did it show up? No? Nothing's happening here. Excuse me? Well, I'm trying to get this, having already some audio visual technical problems. The focus, as I say, isn't gonna get much better than that. We test ran this, and this was about the best we could do. Uh, here we go. Is something showing up here now? Anyway, let me just keep going while we get the, just trying to make the magic pen work here. No magic at the other end. But in any event, I'll come up. Lee's got 60,000 Confederates occupying Fredericksburg, where there had been a bloody battle. He has repulsed three Union invasions uh, since he took command in the spring of 1862. Among the 60,000 soldiers he has there are about 5,000 Alabamians made up, comprised in 12 infantry units and two artillery battalions. He's located there, and for those interested in the unit breakdown, there's the order of battle for the Alabamians. You've got two all-Alabama brigades under Edward O'Neill and Cadmus Wilcox, and then a mixed brigade, Archer's Brigade, which has two Alabama units and the uh, three Tennessee regiments. And I always like to point this out, that as we approach football season, keep that in mind when Alabama and Tennessee are playing. Uh, there's a rivalry then, but these guys are comrades in arms at Chancellorsville. And then you've got two artillery batteries that made up of Alabamians. In all, approximately 5,000 Alabamians in at least 60,000-man army. Okay, try the pen again, see if the, we've got something happening. Well, it works here on the main screen. Is there something on not doing right? Is that it? Oh, oh dear. Well, <coughs> then I'll, I, we'll make it work. I'll improvise here. It'll be just fine. The late Abraham Lincoln appoints a rather brash new commander to take on Lee with the objective of destroying Lee's army and capturing Richmond. Uh, the man is now called Fighting Joe Hooker was his name. And he is in the spring of 1863 at the head of one of the largest field armies the Union ever put together, 130,000 men. So right there you have a better than two to one advantage for the Union Army going up against Lee. Hooker devises a very promising uh, uh, attack plan. He's, it's working now, okay. Let's see, hey, there we are. And if it's appropriate that it's red before we're over. There's gonna be 30,000 combined casualties on this battlefield, so I uh, might as well color the whole thing in red before, before, by the time we're done. But Lee's here with 60,000. Hooker approach, very intelligent. He's gonna have 40,000 men, well, I'm not gonna try to write the number, but he's gonna have 40,000 Union troops containing Lee at Fredericksburg. And then with 70,000 men, the Union Army is gonna cross the Rapidan, Rappahannock and Rapidan Rivers, enter this heavily forested region to the west known as the Wilderness, and try to come in behind Lee and you're gonna have a, what's called a classic hammer and anvil uh, maneuver, where this is the anvil that will hold Lee's army while the bulk of the Union Army is presumably going to crush Lee from the rear. And then all the while, there's another 20,000 Union troops held in reserve to strengthen either side. So it's a good attack plan on paper, and it is executed quite well initially. The maneuvers are very good. By the end of April, on, beginning on the 1st of May, you've got Hooker's army, moving through the woods here, and Lee now, according to Hooker, has really one of two choices. He can retreat south, back toward Richmond, and give up the position, 
or he can stay there and be destroyed. This is Hooker's view. You know, Hooker presumably, or one reportedly said, you know, may God have mercy on Robert E. Lee, for I won't, was Hooker's boast. Lee does neither. He has no intention of retreating. He has no intention of being destroyed. Instead, Lee, ever the aggressor, always one of the great gamblers and one of the most aggressive commanders of the war, decides he's going to attack, leaving a mere 10,000 troops at Fredericksburg to contain the 40,000 Union troops. Among those 10,000 is one of the brigades of Alabamians I, I put up earlier. Lee's going to take the remaining 50,000 men and move against Hooker. And on the 1st of May, you get a meeting engagement between the two where there's some heavy sparring and skirmishing. And at that point, Hooker goes to ground, which means he, begin, he goes into a defensive posture. He digs in, he stops moving. He's like, is Lee going to attack? Fine. Or maybe this is just a feint prior to his retreat. And in any event, Hooker has forfeited the initiative. And this is something you never want to do with Robert E. Lee, because Lee, Lee Love, is always seeking the initiative. And with Lee now, with the initiative, you now control the, and dictate events on the battlefield. And Lee is now prepared to attack. 10,000 here, he's got 50,000 here. He discovers through reconnaissance that Hooker's extreme right flank is vulnerable. It may be it's way out there in the woods, far from the battlefield, or what seems to be the building battlefield, but that's where Lee is going to strike. And he entrusts his famous lieutenant, Stonewall Jackson, to take 30,000 men on a very circuitous march through the woods on one of the few good roads to come in on the extreme flank of Hooker. The Union troops are not expecting this. It's, it's largely unsuspected. So Lee has got 10,000 here, 20,000 there, 30,000 there. A numerically inferior army split into three smaller components. That's, 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 that's uh, Lee's risk taking here. But it's going to pay big dividends. Among the soldiers that, that are with Jackson are seven regiments of Alabamians. Put this map up here for a moment. Back to that one. Now we're more focused on the wilderness area. Here's the bulk of the Union Army around here, and you got Chancellorsville, actually a little bit farther over here, but it's a several mile front. But Jackson has positioned his army, put it in line of battle, 30,000 men lined up perpendicular to the only good road in the area, the Orange Turnpike. And they're perpendicular here, ready to lay in with this devastating flank attack. It took Jackson eight hours to move his army 12 miles. And the Union are pretty much snoozing here during all of this. There's a few units that saw what was going on, but nobody expected this. At the very front and center of Jackson's flank attack that he is just ready to unleash here in the afternoon of the 2nd of May, is O'Neill's Alabama Brigade, five veteran regiments of Alabamians. They are going to spearhead the attack. And at 5 p.m., Jackson gives the green light. A rebel yell rips through the forest as 30,000 rebels move forward, chasing forest animals in front of them. Deer, everything else was, running in, was fleeing in front of this. And they catch Hooker's flank in the air, wide open, it is one of the, for the Confederacy, it's one of the most glorious moments of the war, to catch an entire Union Corps off guard like this, for this whole, the improbable attack, the odds that this would even be set up without being discovered, and then executed so with such devastating fashion, is, is, has got to have been an exhilarating experience for the Confederates involved. Here's a gentleman who was part of the attack. This is Edwin L. Hobson. Well, I've got I'll, the risk of brushing too many buttons. I'm just going to leave it here for the moment. Lieutenant Colonel Edwin L. Hobson, he is the commander of the 5th Alabama Regiment. He's a 28-year-old planter from Greene County. He owned 27 slaves. And as the rather fearsome visage shows you there, he seems to be a man with a, with, who exudes a command presence. And he is. He's well respected by the men of the 5th Alabama. He's on the 
He is commanding the regiment on the left flank of O'Neill's brigade, which is spearheading this attack. And his men noticed throughout the attack that he was conspicuously waving his sword, exhorting the men forward, keeping them moving. But he was, act in addition, while the Yankees are fleeing, he's actually spending more time trying to maintain the cohesion of his regiment. Because as in the route that follows, you've got a lot of young rebels running forward and others are stopping to loot uh, baggage trains and, and, and scoop up Union casualties. And the regiment running through the woods is coming unglued and he's spending more time trying to hold it together and keep the attack going because Jackson has ordered speed, tempo, move, move. The 5th Alabama under Hobson will capture a Union battery, scoop up two guns, and corral in 200 Union prisoners. But there is some sporadic resistance. Uh, the, it's not a complete walkover, although this is quite a romp for the Confederates, driving the Union back two miles here and, and annihilating an entire Union Corps for all practical purposes. But the Union do mount some rear guard actions, and in one of those, Hobson is shot in the left thigh. He brushes off the wound, although it's bleeding profusely, and keeps moving. He is not about to abandon the field on this glorious moment. Nobody, no, no Confederate wants to, wants to leave. This, this, is, this is too exciting. That evening when the battle petered out and the troops are strung out all through the woods, exhausted from their chase, uh, Hobson realized that the wound was pretty serious. The, the man nearly bled to death. Uh, he would survive, he would not fight further in the Battle of Chancellorsville, but he would survive and, and later go on um, to fight with distinction in later campaigns. But he served his purpose for Lee's Alabama boys at Chancellorsville. He has helped break, or rather the attack that he's participated in has given Lee a chance for victory. It doesn't secure the victory, but it gives Lee a chance for victory. And we move into May 3rd, Sunday, the, d the next day. Incidentally, and this is about Alabamians, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Stonewall Jackson was uh, mortally wounded by friendly fire on the evening of, of, second, of the May 2nd. And so the Confederates who would be deprived of his services, and he would later, you know, later die. Uh, Jeb Stewart takes command of the Confederate left wing. Lee, ever the aggressor, wants to press the advantage. He orders a full-scale attack at the crack of dawn. So these guys have been running through the, marching all day, running through the woods. They're strung out. He says, reorganize your regiments, get a couple hours of sleep, and then hit the Yankees again. He, won't, he senses a, a major victory here. <clears throat> but the situation is going to be different on May 3rd. The Union are on the alert now. They are dug in around the Chancellorsville area, and then there's some other soldiers, uh, divisions up toward the Rappahannock. It's not going to be a walkover the way it was the day before. If uh, May 2nd was something of a romp for the Confederates. May 3rd, Sunday, is going to be a slugfest. This is the day of carnage. This is the bloodiest day of the battle. At, in the early morning, Jeb Stewart determines that the key terrain to begin the attack is to seize Hazel Grove. I know you can't really see the terms up there, uh, but Hazel Grove is the highest elevation in the area. Stewart wants to capture that put artillery up here, which can then command a field of fire all over the Union position around Chancellorsville. Among the units that move against Hazel Grove in the early morning hours is the 5th Alabama Battalion, as opposed to the 5th Alabama Regiment, but the 5th Alabama Battalion. One of the officers in the 5th Alabama Battalion is this gentleman here. This is 2nd Lieutenant William Bryan Hutton. Hutton. Hutton's a 22-year-old college student. Uh, he had, was matriculating for a while at UVA, when the when University of Virginia. When the war broke out, he, he came back home and joined uh, the 5th Alabama. He's from Sumter County. He was a very promising uh, student, a promising scholar. He was uh, proficient in lit Latin and Greek had a fascination for the classical world. But he's now serving in the, in the Confederate Army, the 5th Alabama. A, a rather strict individual, he had a strong work ethic, but he had a congenial nature too, according to the soldiers that, that, worked, uh, that served under him, and they liked him a lot. He was a good drill master, uh, but, but uh, the soldiers respected him. And, he, and the 5th Alabama is, battalion is setting up the skirmish line. That is, those are the soldiers out front that make first contact. 
and they, they're moving up Hazel Grove, the high ground, on the early morning of May, May 3rd. When the battalion commander goes down with a wound, Hutton takes over and orchestrates the initial assault on Hazel Grove, which will ultimately be successful. They will overrun it. But unfortunately for Hutton, uh, the Union fired a volley into the 5th Battalion. He was hit in the chest, fatally wounded, and would die that night. And unfortunately, thus ended a promising uh, career of a young scholar. But again, Hutton, though killed in action, accomplishes a vital role you know, the 5th Battalion and, and, and other Confederates attacking Hazel Grove. The rebels now have the high ground here. And then in the course of the rest of the morning, they're going to put 30 cannon on that eminence, and they are going to be pounding the Union position around Chancellorsville. And it's at this point I now want to shift to the north of Hazel Grove. You know, the, incidentally, the 5th Alabama was part of Archer's Brigade that came in and hit Hazel Grove in this fashion, as the big blurry red line um, indicates. As Hazel Grove is going down, Stewart is launching massive frontal attacks through the woods. This is dense forest here against the Union positions. And the first two lines are repulsed or they bog down. The fear fighting is so fierce that in some cases there were some Virginia regiments that just cracked under the pressure and refused to advance. Stewart calls on his reserve force, you know, Rhodes Division in, in, the, in the back of the line, including O'Neill's Alabama Brigade. Now those guys, they're right here, right on the Orange Turnpike, which is the only good road through the woods. Uh, this brigade, <coughs> it spearheaded Stonewall's attack on the afternoon of May 2nd. They've been held in reserve on the morning of May 3rd. But as the attack bogs down, Jeb Stewart's calling on his reserves to come forward and crack this line. They have got to punch through, because Lee is in the process of applying pressure from the south. Uh, Lee personally commanding down here, Jeb Stewart over there. The 3rd Alabama Battalion is right on the road as they move forward to try penetrating the outer defenses around, outer Union defenses around Chancellorsville. <coughs> One of the officers in the 3rd Alabama is this young man, Captain Watkins Feeling. He's in his early 20s. He's from Montgomery. I'm still doing more research on him to find out a little bit more about what, what, uh, what Phelan did for a living. But he's, he's a company commander um, leading one of the wings of the regimental attack. And there's a certain advantage to being next to the road in that the 3rd Alabama doesn't have to tromp through so many trees, and they have a better vision of what's going on, but they also draw more fire because the Union can, and they can see them better, and so there's a, a pro and con to being on the road here. Watkins, Phelan's men, and there's, along with the rest of the regiment, are running against some pretty stiff resistance. One of the soldiers serving under Watkins, Phelan, recalled after the war, he described this moment on the battlefield. I'll read a quote to you here. The ping of the mini ball. The splutter of canister, the whistling of grape, the where are you, where are you of screaming shells, and the cannon's roar from a hundred mouths went to make up the music for this great opera of death. That was a very vivid crescendo of, of firepower swirling back and forth. The third Alabama is hard pressed. Watkins feeling, incidentally, he, he will survive this battle. He is later killed at Petersburg uh, toward the end of the war. But Watkins Phelan's regiment is ably assisted by a battery of the Jeff Davis artillery, Alabamian gunners. And one of the gunners, they're right behind the 3rd Alabama providing supporting fire. And one of the soldiers in the 3rd Alabama, or in the, th in the uh, Jeff Davis artillery, sorry, one of the soldiers there is Corporal John Purifoy, this gentleman here. He's a 21-year-old law student from Wilcox County, and uh, he saw very little action on the first day of the battle, which was, you know, the guns couldn't keep up with the, with the impetus of the Confederate attack. They're dragging their guns through the woods. <clears throat> but he sees plenty of action here on the morning of May 3rd, and he's providing able supporting fire for the 3rd Alabama Regiment to his front. John, uh, Corporal, Corporal Purifoy here, recalled a, a very tense moment. I'm going to paraphrase uh, his recollection of the moment, but he said at one point where he was working a gun, lining up a shot, 
trying to get the aim right. He looked up and he saw a Union cannonball coming right toward him. He could see the trajectory coming right at him. I don't know how he did it, but he calculated in his mind that it wasn't going to hit him, that it was going to pass to his right. And so he stayed at the gun and kept you know, preparing the shot. And sure enough, the round whizzed right past the right side of his head. He could, he could, he could feel it, the heat of it go by. And it bounced and you know, did some damage to the case on behind him. But he stayed, this, stayed in this position and returned fire. And then I always think that presumably there was some hapless Yankee corporal watching a cannonball coming back toward him now, <laughs> wondering if he could calculate the trajectory of the shot in the same way Purifoy did. The gun is heavily involved. The Jeff Davis battery fired over 300 rounds in support of the, of the attack on Chancellorsville. They, they exhausted their supply and ended up having to, when they ran out, they, they fell back. But this is, this is important artillery support. To the left of the 3rd Alabama, if I put this map up here very briefly again, keep you oriented to the map, the action I've been describing is right in this area. The, the, the outer defenses are crumbling as the reserves are brought in and the Alabamians are uh, playing an instrumental role in cracking the outer defenses of the Union position around Chancellorsville. To the left of the 3rd Alabama is the 6th Alabama Infantry. The executive commander, the executive officer in the regiment is this young man here, uh, Major Augustus M. Gordon. The other figure is uh, uh, unidentified in, in, the, in the photograph. But this is Augustus M. Um, M. Gordon, a major. And as, as you can tell by the picture, he's a youthful uh, looking character. He's only 21 years old. Uh, he is a farmer from Jackson County and is the younger brother of the more famous General John Brown Gordon, who some of you may be familiar with, who was, was famous in the Confederate Army. He's the younger brother, a major in the 6th Alabama. And at the, while the 3rd Alabama and, and Purifoy's gun are fighting off to their right, the 6th Alabama is trying to crash through the woods, and the, and, and the Alabamians are firing at will. And Gordon wanted to try to orchestrate volley fire. He thought, let's pause for a moment get everybody online and deliver a concentrated volley, which makes sense. But while he was trying to set this up, he was hit multiple times in the torso and was killed in action on the field. As he died, he's reported to have said, I am glad to give my life for the cause, which led to weeping and, and much grief and gnashing of teeth on the soldiers around him because he was, he was described as a beloved officer. He dies there at Chancellorsville right within sight of the Chancellor House itself. The attack continues, even though the body count is mounting. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning at this point, and Lee, as the, as, as the rebels are punching through at this point, Lee is determined to link up his army. He wants a contiguous line. Right now there's still a gap. And so he sends word to Jeb Stewart to start shifting your forces to the right, to the east, to link up, so there'll be a contiguous line of attack. He also, typical of Lee, is he says, not only do I want you to shift to the right, but I want you to keep attacking, too. So you have to attack and shift to the right. We're going to maintain the momentum of the, of the assault. As the generals are, sh are denuding the strength of the left flank here to comply with Lee's orders, the rebel left is now vulnerable, and the Union begin launching counterattacks. They're trying to turn uh, the rebel left flank here. One of the regiments tasked with trying to hold and shore up the, the ex increasingly exposed left flank is the 12th Alabama Infantry Regiment. The officer in charge that day is Major Adolf Proskauer. Proskauer is a bookkeeper from Mobile, Alabama. He's in his early 30s. I don't know exactly when he was born because some of the, his, his early records are un, un, unclear, primarily because he is a Jewish immigrant from Germany. He's recently arrived, and he's an example of, of rare diversity in the Confederate ranks. He was also, the men described him as the best-dressed man in the regiment, too. And if you look at the photograph, I suppose that uh, he's certainly well-groomed here and takes care of his appearance. 
only weeks before the battle, he's in command here at this critical moment where the Union are, are trying to turn the flank and he's trying to hold the left flank, and him and a few other Confederate regiments, it's not the 12th by itself. Only a few weeks before, Proskauer had passed a very grueling examination on tactics. His regimental commander, a man named Samuel Pickens, who was now running the brigade after Edward O'Neill was wounded in action, uh, uh, command evolving to Proskauer. But Pickens didn't really like Proskauer. Uh, there's some suggestion that Pickens was anti-Semitic and didn't really care much for, for Adolf Proskauer. And so while Proskauer was going before this uh, examination on tactics to get promoted from captain to major, Pickens basically told the exam board, be really hard on this guy. Wink, wink, fail him. Proskauer, however, answered every question flawlessly. He, in fact, was teaching the examination board a thing or two about tactics. And the board had to give him the promotion. There was no other way around it. And now, uh, several weeks later, we're May 3rd at Chancellorsville. And I guarantee you, there wasn't a single Alabamian in that regiment that gave a damn whether he was a Jew or not. They were thankful that they had a very capable leader at the helm. Because Proskauer does orchestrate a very effective defensive action. He refuses the flank. I'll just draw here on the, you know, he fought as the Union are coming in, he simply keeps withdrawing the flank back, kind of an elusive flank. The Union can never quite get to the flank because it's evading them. And all the while, Proskauer is maintaining a steady return fire. And in the process, the 12th Alabama helps break uh, the Union counterattack and hold the left flank. And Proskauer is to be commended for his talent that day. Serving under Proskauer at the same point. Is a private Henry B. Wood serving in the 12th. Benefiting from Proskauer's leadership. Henry B. Wood is a 33-year-old overseer from Coosa County. You know, by overseer, I, I'm, I, he, he is a supervisor of, of slaves. He supervised the slaves on his father's plantation. He's fighting with Proskauer and vividly recalled the wild melee of the moment. He wrote a letter to his parents just a few days after the battle, and here's an excerpt I'd like to read to you. It says, it was an awful time, the heaviest shelling and graping that I ever saw. For anyone to pass through the woods where we went, it would look impossible for men to go through there without being torn up with a grape shot or shell. The timber is literally torn down. He then goes on to make a comment that sometimes was you know, common with, uh, with the rank and file who were hard pressed. He then says, I think our brigade was imposed on. We was kept in when there was other fresh troops that ought to have relieved us. Well, he may have thought that at the time, but Lee had every Confederate actively engaged. He, he, there was a, he maximized his, his use of force. He concludes his letter by saying, I went through safe, but I thought several times that I had gone up the spout. He did not go up the spout at Chancellorsville. He would, however, be captured at Gettysburg a few weeks later, and he would die in a Union prison camp at Fort Delaware. So unfortunately for Mr. Wood, he never sees home again. We've seen the fighting where the Alabama Brigade has helped break through. I want to conclude this section. There's another big part of the battle I want to talk about for, uh, after I finish the Chancellorsville fight. Uh, the pressure's mounting. The guns on Hazel Grove by 10 o'clock in the morning are, are having a devastating effect. The, the, the Union position is cracking around, uh, not only by the d heavy attacks, but the concentrated artillery fire. And the 26th and the 5th Alabama regiments participate in a successful attack that penetrates the Union inner defenses around Chancellorsville itself. They break in, they break through, and they plant their flags, both the 5th and the 26th Alabama. One of the officers in the 26th Alabama is Captain Enoch M. Vandiver. He commands Company A, which is the marquee company in, in the regiment. A 31-year-old from Fayette County, uh, again, like with Watkins Phelan, I'm trying to learn a bit more about this man, but there he, there's his wartime photograph. He's leading part of the attack that breaks through. They plant, the 26th and the 5th plant their flags. 
the Union counterattack and, cap and capture both of the flags driving the Alabamians off. One of the flags, the fifth, is on display here, and Bob Bradley, at, at the conclusion of my talk, will elaborate more fully on the fifth Alabama's flag with bullet holes from the war right through it, but it's captured at Chancellorsville, along with the, briefly the 26th. Vandiver, Alabamians, some North Carolinians and Georgians launch a counter-counter attack and they regain part of the ground and the 26th is able to get its flag back. The 5th Alabama will never see its flag again, at least until its return many years after the war. At some point during this fray, Vandiver is wounded, shrapnel shatters his ankles and he's dragged off the field. But he is instrumental, along with many other Confederates at that point in the battle, in cracking the last stronghold in the Chancellorsville area. The Union Army now is falling back closer to the Rappahannock, deeper into the woods. Lee's got his contiguous line now. So things are looking good for Lee, for the Confederates. Back to a broad map here again. By noon, you've got Hooker boxed in, even though he's brought another 10,000 troops in. He still heavily outnumbers the Confederates, but he's, he's completely out and been psyched out. The, the Lee mystique has left him confused. He's also uh, suffered a concussion from a cannonball, so he's not operating with a full deck. But the Union fall back into this position. Lee's preparing for a, what he hopes will be a final victorious onslaught. When he receives word that a critical situation is developing, to the east. Those 40,000 Union troops who have been containing Lee's force around Fredericksburg are ordered to cross the river, storm the high ground, and move rapidly to hit Lee in the rear. And I guess at that point, these Union soldiers will then attack. And then, so there may be a pincer after all here for Hooker. A critical moment. The 10,000 Confederates who were trying to hold the line here, or they fight for a few hours and then they're broken through, most of them retreat to the south. But the Alabama Brigade under Cadmus Wilcox, on the brigade commander's own initiative, decides not to retreat south, but to engage in a very skillful rear guard action, delaying the advance of three Union divisions who are trying to move down the Orange Plank Road and get in behind, behind Lee. Cadmus Wilcox and five veteran Alabama regiments. They decide to make their stand at Salem Church. This inset shows a little more detail of, uh, uh, of the location. Salem Church is at a crossroads. And it's at that point that Wilcox says, we're going to dig in. We're going to make a stand, and hopefully reinforcements will arrive. Here's Salem Church, a picture taken in 1881. And these are uh, veterans of the of the battle. I don't know which unit they're from. I don't even know if they're Alabamians, but they are veterans from the, from the battle. The Salem Church is a, a brick edifice uh, built in 1844 to serve a Baptist congregation. And then on May 3rd, Sunday, it becomes the focal point of one of the major actions of the Battle of Chancellorsville. One Alabamian who was defending in the area said that the house of God became a charnel house in the midst of the fighting. Wilcox puts an entire company from the 9th Alabama Infantry Regiment inside the church, and then the rest of his, the rest of his brigade lines up about 60 yards uh, to the west on a slight elevation behind it. But they got a pretty good field of fire. It's fairly open farm country, much different than the heavily forested area where most of the fighting's been taking place. Deployed directly behind the Salem Church is the 10th Alabama. And one of the soldiers in the 10th Alabama is Private Bailey McClellan. Make a shift here. Private Bailey G. McClellan. He's a 23 year old school teacher from Calhoun County. He and his comrades have been feverishly building makeshift breastworks. They were, whatever instruments they had in hand, they were digging a, like a foxhole for themselves, throwing up rocks, dirt, tree limbs to try to get an improvised defensive position as this Yankee juggernaut is coming up over the horizon, heading directly toward them. And McClellan watches 
as the Union Army swarms around the Salem Church, just 60 yards to the front, while the company in there is firing away. Now, McClellan is a devout Baptist himself, and it's a Sunday, and he must have felt very odd firing in the direction of a Baptist church on Sunday, but fire he did at this swarm of Union forces coming toward him. The, the, the 10th has, has got a, you know, delivers a pretty devastating volley. But McClellan recalls a moment where the, there are a number of Yankees outside the church. They're trying to break inside, break down the barricade. And he hears, in his words, a sandy-whiskered lieutenant, Union lieutenant, as he describes it, yelling out to his men, show no quarter, break in, kill everyone inside. And this angered McClellan and his comrades, and they redoubled their efforts, and they concentrated their fire on this lieutenant. And then McClellan doesn't know whether he hit the lieutenant, but the lieutenant went down and never got up again. Now, having said that, that's a brief moment of success there because the weight of the attack, you got one brigade here trying to contain three divisions. Granted, there are other Confederate reinforcements hastily arriving to shore up the flanks. You've got some Confederates setting up. This is, this is, uh, this is the Alabama position, right out perpendicular to the road, and the bulk of the attack is hitting them. There are some other rebels or Confederates lining up on the flanks to shore up the position, but the main attack is hit, hits the Alabamians head on. The 10th cannot take the pressure. They've got too many troops hitting them, and they begin to buckle and break and fall back. As they fall back, Wilcox, the brigade commander who was cussing up a storm, I mean, the man had a, a profane mouth and is just issuing orders with a, with a cuss word intermixed between every, every, every other noun and verb. He is rushing the rem remnants of the 9th Alabama. There's one company in the church house that is that, in the Salem Church that's now surrounded and in the process of being captured. Uh, the rest of the 9th is being held as a reserve, and he orders that forward, and the 9th and the 10th Alabama now fighting side by side try to hold, hold the breach or, st or stop the breakthrough. One of the soldiers in the 9th Alabama is another McClellan, William G. McClellan. I just talked about Bailey uh, George McClellan, and now we've got William, William C. McClellan of the 9th Alabama. He's a 24-year-old farmer from Limestone County. He wrote after the battle, he was writing a letter to his family in which he, he admitted that he actually started chuckling when he saw the 10th Alabama break and fall back. He was laughing to himself because apparently there was a, a long-standing rivalry between the 9th and the 10th Alabama where they each, you know, the 9th Alabama claimed it was the best regiment in the brigade and always said the 10th broke and ran when the, when the pressure got too hard in battle. And here's the 10th falling back again. And McClellan, with a little chuckle but with seriousness, joins in the counterattack and the two, the two Rivals in camp are now fighting side by side in their effort to, to contain this, this Union breakthrough. So it's a critical moment on the battlefield. If the 10th and the 9th don't hold, the, the center is, is punctured, and who knows whether the whole position collapses or not. But now the action shifts just to the right of the 9th and the 10th. The 8th Alabama, very difficult to see here, it's a little blurry, but there's the 8th Alabama which is holding the right flank of the brigade. The 8th Alabama is commanded by Colonel Young Lee Royston. He's a 34-year-old lawyer from Perry County. And he's an intimidating individual because he stands six foot seven. He's a towering presence. He tells the 8th, we're going to stand here, and nobody's retreating. And I suppose if a six foot seven man tells you you're not going to retreat, you're not going to retreat. The 8th Alabama, Royston waits for the Union attack as it's sweeping over Salem Church. There's a regiment coming toward his men. He waits till they're about 40 yards away. This is near point blank fire with, with rifled musketry. He orders his regiment to fire, and the first volley, you know, Wither. It's a withering volley. The Yankee line literally crumpled right in front of the 8th Alabama. But again, there's many, many more Yankees coming. The Union returned fire. Several bullets hit Royston in his left arm, and they completely mangle and disable it, and it's, it's hanging there. Uh, and even though he doesn't want to leave the battle, he's, 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 it's, a, it's a bad wound, and if it's not tended to, he'll die. So he's, he leaves the field. 
the giant is gone, but a very capable officer takes his place. Lieutenant Colonel Herbert A. Hillary is the, or Hillary A. Herbert, it's the first name is last, I guess it confuses me. He's a 29-year-old lawyer from Butler County. And you know, for those of you that know about Alabama history after the war, he'll later uh, serve in Congress for Alabama, be in uh, Grover Cleveland's administration as Secretary of Navy, was a big proponent of building the great white fleet that was used to win the Spanish-American War. But that's all in the future for, uh, for the lieutenant colonel here. He immediately takes over from the wounded Royston and displays brilliant tactics that, that saved the day at Salem Church. So I'll just go ahead and write here next to his face. This is actually a post-war photograph. He's a little older in the photograph than he was at, at, at the battle. But again, if this is the 9th and the 10th trying to hold the line, and here's the 8th, you know, it's just you know, effectively you know, repelling Union forces near them. Here's Salem Church. Herbert Hillary, as the Union forces are breaking through, skillfully pulls off a, a, a tactical wheel, re reverse wheel to the left, which means that while half of his regiment continues firing to its front, the other half, close to the danger point, wheels back to create a right angle. And so you pretty much have a situation where here's the 9th and the 10th, and then here's the 8th in a right angle, and then there's Union forces here. The 9th and 10th are holding their own. The 8th Alabama delivered a very devastating enfilade fire that ripped through the Union ranks. It shatters the whole attack. There was, after the battle, a, a count of about 250 Union soldiers lay dead in this, this kill zone, or kill sack would be a modern term to describe it. Uh, it's, it's a decisive moment on the battlefield. The Union attack has spent itself with that with that display of, of tactics on, on the 8th Alabama's part. And then Her Wilcox, who's now more satisfied with the situation, perhaps cussing less, ordered the entire Alabama brigade to advance forward. And then the other near neighboring uh, Confederate forces who've arrived, you get this general attack that drives the whole Union force back off the field. Salem Church is recaptured. The Alabama company that was inside is liberated. And Salem Church is a tremendous success. Uh, the, the Alabamians captured another 400 Union in the, in the route that followed. For all intents and purposes, after Salem Church, which, is, which happens about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, on, on most of the fighting's been over here, then you get this late afternoon critical fight. For all intents and purposes, the battle is won. Hooker will have no more of it. And over the next two days, the Union Army withdraws back across the Rappahannock and retreats back toward Washington, D.C. Lee has achieved his improbable victory, uh, thanks in large part to the Alabamians who were serving under him. The casualties are heavy. Here's the same order of battle I showed earlier, but this, has, this, this includes casualties. There were about 2,000 Alabamians in O'Neill's brigade, about 2,000 in Wilcox, um, and then uh, several hundred in each of, of the, of the uh, regiments in Archer's Brigade, but it's hard to see there, but you can, I'm trying if you can make out that it, the casualties are pretty evenly distributed. There wasn't a, very few re Alabama regiments suffered fewer than 100 casualties. The 5th suffered the most. They're the ones that broke through at Chancellorsville and suffered the heavy counterattack where they lost their flag. Uh, but about 1,500 Alabama casual, Alabamians were killed and wounded at Chancellorsville. Overall, Lee's army suffered 13,000 casualties inflicted 17,000 casualties on, on the, on the uh, defeated Union. By way of conclusion, I'll say that Alabamians, they played a crucial role at every point on the battle, all of the turning points, all of the key moments, from spearheading that flank attack that made the victory possible. I don't know how that happened. Uh, well, don't press my luck here. Uh, but from spearheading the attack that makes the victory possible, to taking the high ground at Hazel Grove, to penetrating the Union defenses at Chancellorsville, to repelling the last major threat at Salem Church, Alabamians from beginning to end helped make Lee's greatest victory possible. Thank you very much.
I'd like to now uh, hand the mic over uh, for a few moments to Bob Bradley, who'd like to say a few words about the flag of the 5th Alabama that was captured at Chancellorsville. You need mine? George, there we go. Hey, how's everybody doing? You can hear me now. Uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, you would be glad to know this is going to be very, very brief. Uh, in fact, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, to quote David Center, I could listen to Bob Bradley go on forever, and he usually does. So I won't do that. Uh, the flag that you see before you on the table here is the flag that Ben uh, mentioned that was captured at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, the flag is referred to as a Richmond Depot third wool bunning issue, and I'll explain all of that to you later. Basically, they began to manufacture these in July of 1863. Uh, this particular, 62, the flag was issued to the regiment in April, and it was captured on May 3rd. So it was in use for about maybe three weeks at the most. Following its capture, it was inscribed with capture information by the Federals who had captured the flag. It was forwarded to the U.S. War Department, where it remained until 1905. And in 1905, um, Secretary of War William Howard Taft had these flags returned to the individual states. Alabama was the recipient of around 25 of these flags, and they're all still with us today. They have a lot of companions. There are 90 Civil War period Confederate flags in our collection, and as some of you know, we've had a very, very successful flag conservation project. Uh, at this point, we are working on our 16th flag. In this auditorium, there are members of organizations who have contributed to this flag fund over the years. If you're a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, United Daughters of the Confederacy, Sons of Union Veterans, or the Friends of the Alabama Archives, please stand up and be recognized. Come on, stand up. <laughs> Without your assistance, it would not have happened. Uh, I'll be available for questions and over near the flag um, if you have any uh, more questions about it. Uh, do we have time for Ben to take a few questions? We have time for two questions. We would like for you to speak directly into the microphone, please. I guess my, my hand's got some. <laughs> any questions for <laughs> Mr. Severance? We have one right here. Okay. Is it still on? Okay. You didn't say much about uh, General Rhodes, and I thought he was kind of the hero of the uh, of the first attack. General Robert Ro Ro he is he is the division commander uh, and a a very capable officer under Stonewall Jackson. I wanted to try to keep the focus on on more of uh, close to the regimental uh, soldiers that were fighting. Rhodes does command the division. Formerly commanded O'Neill's uh, brigade of the five uh, Alabama regiments I talked about, and he does. He's a, he was a very aggressive, uh, sometimes impetuous commander. He does play an important role in keeping the momentum of the attack going, especially on the 3rd of May when it was bogging down. Uh, Rhodes brought up the reserve division and was instrumental in, in, in achieving the breakthrough. He's, he's moving units around on the battlefield. Uh, you're, you're, it, he, he's sometimes considered an Alabamian. I think of him more as a Virginian, uh, but, but uh, he is... He's an important character, and I, I, I didn't mean, I don't mean to, to minimize the, the role of anyone. All of the, just about all of the, the uh, Confederate uh, soldiers and officer corps are, are, are on their game at Chancellorsville. Uh, do you have any research or reason why Lee didn't continue the pursuit? Well, 13,000 casualties uh, over a, a three-day, three-plus-day fighting, it, 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 it's pretty exhausting. Uh, he's, he, the Union Army falls back apart. Once they're across the Rappahannock, now they've got that nice big river to defend if Lee tries to push it. Lee did want to continue the attack had Hooker stayed on the, on the uh, south side. But once he's across, you then have to go through the logistics of crossing and, and Hooker withdraws. He does, however, I mean, he, he may not attack immediately, uh, continue the pursuit, but in a way he does in a strategic sense because he will then reorganize the army and head north and in, in his second invasion of the North, which will culminate at the Battle of Gettysburg. So with really within a matter of weeks after, or a couple of months after Chancellorsville, uh, Lee is uh, in Union territory uh, fighting the, the Titanic Battle at Gettysburg. But it's, it's 
a little too easy sometimes to say, why not just pursue? After three or four days of heavy fighting through those woods with 13,000 casualties, these guys, any, anybody's going to be pretty well worn out. 